is unavailable. Let's try again. Uh, okay. Well, everyone, thank you for joining. We're gonna wait just a minute or three here for more people to trickle in. In the uh, meantime, <coughs> I'm gonna go ahead and <coughs> cough profusely, but tweet that we're live. Uh, Alexa, you wanna welcome people who you recognize? Yeah, for sure. So many interesting people. So welcome, welcome, Ellen. Nice to see you again. Uh, welcome, Ricky. I'm so nice. You, you don't miss any of our webinars. Welcome, Robert, Shane, Todd, Patrick, Alexei Ilyashov. Nice to see you in the list. Nikolai, welcome, Nick, welcome. Uh, interesting. From what places people are joining? What countries, what continents? Kazakhstan. Welcome, Bauzhan. I am joining from an atypical location. I'm almost always based in the Netherlands, but I'm actually in New York today. We have a meetup this evening in New York that I'm super looking forward to. If Patrick's in Boston, another East Coast visitor. Alexei in the Bay Area, awesome. So if you are in Boston, you still have a chance to visit our meetup in New York today. In how many hours? Uh, math is hard and my calendar is still set to the wrong time zone six hours from now. Okay, so it will be not, not a problem to watch this webinar and then go to our meetup in New York. <laughs> I think perhaps we have my favorite answer that I've ever seen. Uh, my grandma's kitchen in Germany. That may oh. be the best place to join any uh, event from. Yeah. France, Greece, Warsaw, I love seeing all these uh, locations roll in. It's the beauty of a distributed company building distributed systems with a distributed community is you don't get to see each other enough, but you do get to work with and alongside amazing people wherever they happen to choose to live. All right, beauty. We're going to let a couple more people roll in, but uh, in, the, in the short term, I'll go ahead and kick us off. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, whether you're on the Zoom call, whether you're watching the live stream on YouTube, it truly is a privilege to speak with slash at you all every month. This is another release call, 23.4 is here. Alexa is gonna walk through it in detail. A few housekeeping items, uh, regardless of what platform you're on, chat is open. Uh, please ask questions. We keep an eye on it and we'll, we'll leave time at the end to answer as many of them as we can. And if there's some we don't get to, we're going to start answering those in, uh, in blog posts. Um, your participation, you sharing this, uh, is deeply meaningful to all of us. And if you haven't yet, uh, join the community. Um, go to the, the website in its beautiful new design and form and uh, click the lovely Slack button or, or the Telegram button or the button that belongs to the community you most like and participate in the conversation. So with that, Alexei, I'm going to hand it off to you to talk about 23.4. Okay, let me share. So what do we have in the new release 23.4? First of all, it's a nice number, two, three, four, easy to remember. Uh, so let me show it and I hope we'll have just a few minutes for your questions. But most of the time I will spend explaining what is new because we have a lot 
of new features. So let's let me start. We have about 15 new features, 11 performance optimizations, and even more bug fixes as usual about the new features. Uh, this is quite simple and small and highlighted here. It is to allow trailing commas before from section in select. Sometimes you write columns and you separate these columns by a comma and you want to add or remove uh, columns. And if you ask someone professional, they will tell you, don't worry, just write commas before the column name and it will work perfectly and you will be able to quickly add or remove columns and no problem at all. But it looks slightly uglier to put this uh, comma on a new line. So instead you can write it as usual, but in previous version, if you have a trailing comma and forgot to remove it, you will get a very explanatory error message. It will tell you that you might want to write or and or between or not between or like or I like or not like or whatever, or maybe instead of this comma, you want to write into out file because why not? You may want it, but this is not what you actually want. And in new ClickHouse version 23.4, it just works. Small and nice feature, and you will find it useful. Uh, this is quite similar. It is about how it is possible to specify settings in the command line for ClickHouse client. So imagine you want to change a setting, name it max underscore threads. And you know that in ClickHouse, the name of this setting is max underscore threads, exactly like this with underscore. But if you write it in the command line, sometimes you will automatically write it like this, dash dash max dash threads one. In previous version, it did not work. And the first time I noticed it, I immediately created a task, an issue on GitHub with a proposal to just support this alternative way to write this setting. And if you are pedantic and conservative, you will say, no, this feature should not exist because the actual name of the setting is max underscore threads. But you know, actually, I care more about usability, about ease of use. And if I accidentally written the setting this way, let's just support it. Let it just work. And in the new version 23.4, it just works but it was not enough for me. I was also interested, what if you write it like this and then copy paste this comment to Microsoft Word and send this word to, to another person and it will copy paste it back. And somewhere in the middle, this, uh, two dashes will be replaced to a nice Unicode dash. And I want to, I want it to work as well. And in the new version, it also works. It is quite unusual feature because you will not find it in any other command line applications, applications, even if you, I don't know, if you work with some really modern 
applications in Rust or Node.js or whatever, uh, you will not find this feature. But ClickHouse is even more modern. So ClickHouse does it. What else? So uh, it was about some stupid features, but what about something smarter? And now we have something really smart. Quantile GK function. GK means Greenwald Hanna, and it does sound smart. Why do we need this function and what it does? We have a lot of functions to calculate quantiles. <clears throat> For example, if you want to figure out what is the 19% of your website loading speed, then you need to calculate quantile. <clears throat> and it depends on how many data you have, how much memory is on your server. And sometimes you want to use approximate, uh, approximate algorithms. And when you look at approximate algorithms, you will find that there are many, many different algorithms, different implementations. And looks like we are trying to have just everything in ClickHouse. We have quantile, quantile deterministic, quantile exact, exact weighted, quantile timing, quantile t digest, and quantile b float 16. And now also green white Hanna. Okay, let's take a look how it works. I will show you a demo. <clears throat> so let me switch to a terminal and open and run the server. I will run the server. It runs, okay. I hope you will, you will see the text. And as usual, I will copy paste some queries from my text file to terminal. So let me try to, to run some quantile function. So what do we have? 416 possibilities. I did not even know that we have so many, so many. It is ridiculous because every function is also, also can contain some suffix modifiers like for each, if, map, merge, array, null. Okay, let me scroll through this list. Okay. Now let's try something interesting. For example, I will calculate a quantile of the screen width of website visitors from a table with uh, 100 million records. And it processes in just 100 milliseconds. We have slightly less than 1 billion records per second. It is normal. It is normal speed for ClickHouse. You might think that it is fast. Yes, it is fast. But for ClickHouse, it is normal. It is just all right. So let me run it several times. Okay. If I will replace it to quantile exact, what the performance will be? It is slower, yeah, just as expected. Quantile is approximate calculation with reservoir sampling algorithm. <clears throat> if you don't know what is reservoir sampling, it is like array of limited size and you put values into this array and when this array is full, you will replace every second value of this array 
when it becomes full again, you will replace every fourth value and so on. And then you will use it as a sample to estimate quantile. But this algorithm is not, not so interesting. I have much better algorithms like quantile T digest. It also works, it is fast. I have quantile timing. Nice. It is even faster. What will happen if I will try a new function quantile GK? I want to explain what is quantile Greenwald Hanna, but I cannot because, because I don't know what it is. If I will ever meet uh, these uh, nice people, Greenwald or Hanna, I will ask them. Or may, maybe I will read their paper, but papers are boring. It is better to meet in person and ask. Okay, let's don't ask, let's try it. Quantile GK, <clears throat> how fast it is. Oops, it does not work at all. <laughs> but uh, don't worry. This aggregate function has, has uh, a mandatory parameter, something like precision. <clears throat> so it requires at least one parameter and a reasonable value is uh, like 100. I don't know what it is. Maybe you will explain me. But nevertheless, let me try it. Okay, it works, it is fast. It, it is nice, maybe, maybe not as fast as different functions and the result is just the same. So median of screen width is 1,638. Okay, let's try <clears throat> something more interesting. For example, if I will run it with ClickHouse benchmark. <clears throat> let's try it. So the minimum speed, uh, the minimum time is 93 milliseconds. If I will compare, for example, with my favorite quantile uh, calculation, it will be, it will be about the same performance, also 98 milliseconds. If I will compare with another favorite algorithm, hmm. looks like it is faster, but maybe not faster, maybe it is the same. Okay, let me try to do something more interesting. I will do aggregation with group by, <clears throat> and I will group by region and calculate quantiles for every region. So maybe in Amsterdam, people have bigger computer screens than in New York. Maybe, let's take a look. Okay, so quantile exact took just 200 milliseconds. The new algorithm quantile GK takes 0 0.5. So for some reason, quantile GK is actually slower than exact calculation. If you have multiple, multiple states of aggregate function. And it highlight, highlights uh, one important point that it makes sense to always optimize functions, not in isolation, but on real data set, on real workloads. So quantile GK may, might be good if you calculate just a single quantile, but it is not so good if you calculate multiple quantiles at once. And it is not as good as quantile, quantile timing. 
quantile timing is fast. So if you will ever meet Greenwald or Hanna, tell them that they should make a pull request to ClickHouse and optimize their function for small small set, uh, sm uh, implement small set optimization. Okay, let's continue. What else do we have as smart as this function? Kolmogorov Smirnov test. It sounds even smarter than Greenwald Hanna. I don't know for what reason, but it, it, it sounds smarter. And I will not explain what it does. Maybe you will explain it to me. But basically you just pass two arguments to this function and it will do something magic. It will calculate some moments and it will just mix this data around and give you two numbers. For some reason, the first number is 0 0.99 and the second number is zero. Okay, let me ask you, what does it mean? You can write your answers to the chat or on YouTube in the comments. And if your answer will be correct, we will send you this T-shirt. Tyler, do you have any answers? Indeed, the first one that's come in says that it's a test for determining distribution or whether distribution is normal or not. Almost correct. Uh, do you have any uh, more answers? Nope, not yet. That's the one that's come in. <clears throat> you know what is scary? If we will not get more answers, you will have to answer. Well, the answer was updated with uh, by percentage as well. Okay, uh, yeah, it, it, it looks like some percentage, but percentage of what? Okay, let's let's just uh, say it, that it's been entirely too long since I've done probability distribution, so okay. I'm probably not the right person to try to answer that. Okay, let's just say that this this one is the winner. What is the name of the winner? Ramazan. Ramazan, congratulations! As usual, you have the right answers to every question. Okay, but this function is not so smart. Sound X. It implements an algorithm that was introduced in year 1918. What a horrible year it was. And the algorithm is not modern. It is entirely obsolete. But we still have to uh, to have this function in ClickHouse just for compatibility because every other SQL database management system already implements this stupid algorithm. How to use it? It will take some text in uh, English or similar and it will give you um, some value that does not change if uh, the text sounds similar. So if we apply it to hello world, it will give you this H464. If you try to say hello world in English, but you are being drunk or stoned, and you say, hello, world. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. It, it cannot be pronounced correctly. It's some kind of uh, alien language. But the result will be the same, H464. The result itself, it does not mean anything. It's just for comparison. 
So maybe you will find this algorithm useful. <coughs> what else do we have for compatibility? Show columns query. Again, it is not a, uh, the most natural, the most, uh, the best way uh, to do it in ClickHouse. In ClickHouse, there is a system table, system.columns, and you just write select star from system.columns. If you write show columns, it is just for compatibility with MySQL. It does a similar stuff, but much more ugly, much uglier. Look here. It shows that counter ID is pre sore. What is pre sore? If you use ClickHouse, you know that we will never write pre all capital sore all caps ever. We just don't do that. It, it looks like you are writing in Cobol in the 70s. But unfortunately, MySQL is also looks like Cobol from 70s. And we have to implement compatibility sometimes. And I will show you for what, why exactly we need this compatibility. Okay, let's, let's skip it. What else do we have? This feature is way more interesting. A format to analyze parquet metadata. Imagine you have a parquet file. <clears throat> you can read it, you can process it, you can run queries, but sometimes you also want to just analyze how many row groups does it have what are statistics for columns? How the columns are compressed? What is the size of compressed and uncompressed data? And we decided to implement it in an elegant way. So uh, you specify the same parquet file, but also specify parquet metadata as the format name. And instead of reading the data from this file, it will read the metadata. Okay, let me show you. I will try to show it to you live right here. Interesting. Do we have? Okay, here is this target file and I will use ClickHouse local. Okay, let me try. It works and it gives a lot of a lot of stuff. Something something interesting and difficult to read. No problem. Let me try to figure out figure out what it is. Describe file. Now I have this description. It will give me the number of columns, rows, row groups, metadata size, version of parquet format, compressed size, uncompressed size, and description of every column and every row group. If I want to output it nicer, I will just use another format, name it pretty JSON each row, just to output this metadata. Oops, a lot of stuff. Why do I need so much data? And how long it will take to output it? And it is just metadata, it is, it is not the data from this file but it contains uh, 100 million records. So it has a, not just a lot of uh, records, it also has a lot of row groups. And for every row group and for every column, 
I have this nested data with all the statistics. The statistics about dictionaries, minimum and maximum value. And I hope we will get use of uh, the statistics for optimizing uh, the reading. Okay, nice feature. What else? A function extract key value pairs. What it does? Imagine you have a format that looks like JSON, but isn't a JSON. It looks like Python pickle, but not a pickle. It looks like PHP serialized, but not even that. It looks like Windows any, but not even close. Maybe something like YAML, but not YAML. TOML, but not TOML. <laughs> okay, uh, Tyler, what, what other formats do you know that contain key value pairs? And how many formats the humanity has to invent before something will happen? There needs to be always at least one more format, right? Like it's just yeah, required yeah. that no no one else's work is sufficient. We we need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, as usual. And unfortunately, we have to support all these wheels. And for this reason, we have this function extract key value pairs. It takes a string with a list of pairs separated by some separators. Here we, we have two possible separators, comma and white space. Uh, keys and values separated by another separator. Here it is just equal sign and uh, keys or values enclosed in some quotes. Here are double quotes and possibly escape it with C style escapes. And it will parse it as map of string to string. And as usual for these formats, it will work in 99 and 999, etc. cases. Maybe it will not support some really obscure format with unusual escaping, but it will solve most of your problems. So it is quite nice that we have this function in version 23.4. Okay, uh, and here is just a small improvement for the replace functions. We have at least four functions to replace a substring in a string. You can replace one needle in high stack. You can replace all the substrings and you can replace exact strings or by matching a regular expression. And with a regular expression, you can always replace with substitutions. And until recently, <coughs> the needle and replacement arguments have to be always constant. And it is normal if you have a regular expression because you might want to have just a single regular expression instead of generating them dynamically. But sometimes you might want to just do some strange stuff and uh, I don't know, construct your regular expression from a column in a table or store regular expressions in a table and apply replacements with these regular expressions. And now it is possible, it works in version 23.4. It works perfectly. And here is an example. Okay, let's talk about my favorite part, performance optimizations. What do we have for performance? 
optimization for party of reading. You know, when I'm talking about parquet, I have slightly mixed feelings because parquet and uh, I should say Apache parquet is a data format that is column oriented. It has support for multiple data types, uh, multiple encodings, it is optimized for reading. It has support for compression. And for me, it sounds very similar to something. It is very similar to ClickHouse native format. And I know that ClickHouse native format is obviously better. But Parquet format is from Apache and it is so popular and people generating a lot of data in this format and we have to support it and we have to do it well and it is not a problem for me i want to integrate with whatever format even if someone will re-implement clickhouse and name it differently and then we'll ask would you like to integrate with this system no problem we will integrate with this system and in previous versions, the support for target was sometimes not as fast as I would prefer. Let me compare. I will show you some demo live right here. Let me again copy paste some queries. No, not this query this query so here is clickhouse local i will do select from url and this url will go to s3 to our public bucket and it will read a hits.parquet file that contains 100 million of records and it will do some aggregation query and I will run this query directly on my machine that has a residential internet connection. So maybe it will be fast. Maybe it will be not so fast. Maybe I will run it and uh, Zoom webinar will break for some reason and it will be funny. So uh, I like to have fun. Let me run it. Three seconds and looks like nothing, nothing broken. It still, still works. Let me run it again because sometimes S3 has their internal caching. So we don't have any caching on this machine. It will go and read it again every time. And the, the time is about 1.4 seconds. And uh, the first query took uh, three seconds seconds because F3 is not so fast. It still has to, um, AWS still has to have some caching internally. Okay, this is a new version, 1.4 seconds from my home internet connection to process 100 million records. It, it looks nice, but let's, let me compare with the previous version. Here is one of previous versions, 23.2. Okay, let me run the same query. Mm, it runs. It does something. It is slow. It is not only slow, it is also annoying. But I want to, to calculate how slower it is. And to calculate how slower it is, I have to wait to the end of this query. 
but it is so annoying in version 23.2. I don't know what to do. I have to wait while this query finish. Tyler, do you have any comments about the slowness of this query? I just have to comment that it does not surprise me that the slowness of the query annoys you. If there's one thing I have learned in the little over a year that we've been working together, it's that there is no tolerance <laughs> for, for slow. I'm surprised you haven't force canceled it yet. I sort of expected that to happen by this point. I want to cancel it, but I have to, I have to keep myself <laughs> and, and cancel. I want to figure out how slower it is. And it surprises me that we did not fix it earlier. Only in version 23.4, you will get this problem fixed. Mm. Yeah, for those for those who are working with parquet files, like not only the metadata description that you already showed, but what you're showing now, these are substantial quality of life improvements uh, for people who spend all day interacting with these. Yeah. I will just go and jump and say <laughs> how much my quality of life is <laughs> Okay, 100. 28 seconds. I don't know why 128. Didn't we specifically slow it down to get a round number? I hope no. I hope not. It is about 100 times slower. Maybe 50, 70 or 80 times slower, but something like this. I don't even bother. Uh, with arithmetics, it speaks for itself. Okay. You still have a chance to scan this QR code. Okay, the chance is over. Let's go to the next performance optimization. Asynchronous connections to replicas. It will be slightly more difficult to explain. So, in previous versions, uh, if you process data on a cluster and you do a distributed query and you have multiple replicas, the connection timeout to these replicas will be controlled by this setting. Connect timeout with failover milliseconds. And it is equal to 50, 50 milliseconds. Why do we need it with uh, such a low value? Because sometimes replicas are unavailable and they don't just refuse connections, but you have uh, network packets not coming in and out from these replicas. You have a network partition. And if you try to connect, the connection will just hang until a timeout. But you want to have a failover to healthy replicas. And for this reason, only the first query will uh, wait for this timeout. Then we will just uh, calculate the statistics and we will go to healthy replica because we will learn that uh, the replica is unavailable and we have another replica. But I don't want to even the first query to spend large amount of time before failing over. And that's why this setting is set to just 50 milliseconds. But there is a problem. You, you might have distributed cluster across the continents. Like I'm in Amsterdam, I want to have a replica in Amsterdam. Tyler is in New York. And Tyler wants to have at least another replica in, in New York. But if a replica in Amsterdam is not available to go to New York, it will take about 150 milliseconds. And it is more than 50 milliseconds, three times more. And the queries will just fail. So for cross-continent clusters, 
for cross continent uh, data import or export if you move data between different clusters. Uh, you used to just modify the value of this setting, and it is in inconvenient. I want everything to work by default. So in the new ClickHouse version, we set this uh, the value of this setting to one second, and it will be enough to go to New Zealand and go back and. So one second will cover all the globe. But we have another setting, name it Hedget Connection Timeout Milliseconds. And it is equal to 50 milliseconds. And what does it mean? It means that we will connect to one replica, wait 50 milliseconds. After 15 milliseconds, we will start connecting to another replica but still trying to wait for the first replica. And whatever replica will answer first, we will use it for data processing. So the connections to different replicas made in parallel. It is named hedged requests. Okay, it is quite difficult to explain, but the effect of this feature is very simple. It just make everything work by default. That's it. This is all, everything for, for this small reason. We want everything to work perfectly by default with the default settings, whatever cluster you have. Okay, what do we have for data lakes? Data lakes, it's a strange thing because we have Apache Iceberg, Apache Fuji, and Apache Delta Lake. Why should we support so many data formats? I don't know, but different companies started at different time implementing slightly different formats. Iceberg from Netflix, Delta Lake from Data bricks, hoodie, I don't remember. Maybe you will tell me. And every data format has its own quirks, its own complications. For Iceberg, we have to support two different versions Iceberg V1 and Iceberg V2. For uh, Delta Lake, we have to support partitioned and no, non partitioned data, checkpoints for optimization of reading, and now we have everything. Integrations. Do you recognize this screenshot? What it is? I will give you just three seconds to, to guess. Okay, anyone? Uh, no, nope. uh, no one has guessed so far. Ah, uh, okay. We implemented this feature for for no one. No one needs <laughs> it. <laughs> what it is? It is Looker integration. Now Looker works with ClickHouse using uh, the MySQL compatibility protocol. It works, it uh, connects uh, to ClickHouse, takes uh, the information for uh, all the tables. You can uh, write queries or, or even uh, do these queries automatically. What is next? Maybe we will add the support for QuickSight. But if you are interested in some business intelligence systems, please tell me what business intelligence systems we have to support next. If you will say MicroStrategy, mm, it will be not so fun to do, but we will go and implement the support for MicroStrategy. So don't worry, tell me 
what business intelligence systems we have to support and we will do it. And in the meantime, we have many improvements for Kafka Connect, for MetaBase, uh, and for our drivers for Go, Python, and Java. Okay, what it is? It is our new website, and our new website has our new design design code. So maybe we will have to print a bunch of uh, new t-shirts and not only t-shirts, maybe uh, some fashionable hoodies, maybe something else, maybe backpacks or cups or whatever. I don't know, maybe we'll make ClickHouse pants uh, if, if you need it. Just tell me, we are open for new ideas. And if you look at our website, you will find many interesting material in our blog. If you are interested in Parquet and how to use it, how to work with it for integrations, read our new blog post. And today, we will have uh, a second part of Apache Parquet blog post specifically about the internals of Parquet and the implementation details in ClickHouse. If you want to know how bad ClickHouse is in joins, or maybe ClickHouse is actually good, read another blog post. And we even have a blog post Name it a story of a serial product manager from my friend. If you are interested how to generate music with SQL queries in ClickHouse, you can read it in, in our new repository, NoiseSQL. Okay, and if you want to use start using ClickHouse today, Go to clickhouse.cloud and get free credits up to 10 terabytes of data. Okay, now we have just five minutes for your questions. Amazing, thanks Alexa. I've been capturing questions throughout. If other folks do have questions, please feel free to drop them in. Uh, Alexa, there's a couple of things that people called out that they would love to see integrations with, um, some of which may have been a light troll, but uh, Power BI was mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was a question saying, uh, will there be Vault support? Uh, yeah, support for HashiCorp Vault, uh, correct? I, that's my assumption, yeah. It was on um, YouTube. So, uh, Vitaly, if uh, that's incorrect, please feel free to let me know, but I assume HashiCorp Vault, yes. Yeah, interesting that you already can integrate ClickHouse with HashiCorp Vault. How to do it? So you want to uh, deliver some uh, keys to ClickHouse configuration file and uh, get these keys from HashiCorp Vault. To do this, just specify from env, it means from environment variable in the ClickHouse uh, configuration file, and it will substitute something from the environment variable. It can be the user's uh, password hash or uh, encryption key. And also uh, add a script to um, a startup or into Docker, uh, uh, startup comments and make this script to go into the HashiCorp world to obtain these keys and to put these keys to environment variable. So with at least some DevOps equilibristic, you will easily integrate with HashiCorp world. Excellent, that makes total sense. Um... It, it just this is isn't really a question, but I think it's a, a fantastic little statement. Um, it's that you're you're actually Alexei eliminating the 
but the query is still running excuse for slacking off from work. So you're taking away one of the one of the ways that we're able to have a break during the day because we can't use the excuse the query is still running if we're using ClickHouse. Ah, actually, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it is not a problem. It is not a problem because in ClickHouse we have a setting specifically for you. It is named max execution speed, and you can say don't run this query faster than say one million records per second. Run your query, go for coffee, and you have an excuse. <laughs> the person who made that comment, I will, I will, I will leave nameless. But uh, there you have your answer. Max execution speed. Um, there's another question that Looker already has a ClickHouse connector, and the question was, should we should we be using the MySQL connector instead of that connector? Yeah, it is quite interesting because for some reason, uh, people demanded specifically for MySQL connector. So maybe the integration with ClickHouse is non-perfect and a better result uh, you will get with uh, just MySQL compatibility. Maybe we have to improve the ClickHouse native connector. Maybe this native connector is not available in some environments uh, when look, where Looker is run, and uh, you still have to use a, a different connector. Gotcha. A bit of a high level question that came in that, that I think is actually a good one to, to touch on. Uh, will queries be faster by separating data into a two table cluster, or is storing in one node good? Uh, if one node is as powerful as two nodes, say you have 64 CPU cores on one machine and one terabyte of memory, instead of two machines of 32 cores and half terabyte of memory, it will be faster on a single machine. And the reason is pretty simple. When you have a single machine, you don't have to transfer data over the network. You don't have to serialize and deserialize the data. The data is accessible inside this one terabyte of memory. It is obviously faster. But what if you already have a powerful machine and it is not enough? Then just add another machine. And with two shards, it will be two times faster most of the time. Sometimes slightly less than two times faster, but it is another story. Understood. Uh, we probably have time for one more, it looks like. Uh, there's two more, but I, I'm going to ask this one uh, in, in particular, and then maybe we'll add one on at the end. But the question was, uh, did anybody else already ask when JSON will be production ready? If not, I'd like to ask it and make it a tradition to ask for JSON being production ready on every call. Ah, okay. So uh, I asked this question to the developer, the father of this feature, and he answered it. I'm not sure. It is difficult to finish. And could you guess what uh, what I said? <laughs> uh, I suspect that you probably answered in two ways. One of which is uh, do it right because doing it right for the user matters. The second of which was probably, and we should do it as soon as possible. Mm. Actually, it, it is slightly different. We uh, decomposed this feature to multiple small pieces that we still have to implement. And we figured out that most of these implementation steps will have their use not only for this feature, but also for many other features. And we looked at these other features in more details to figure out uh, why do we need them and we found that these uh, additional side goals 
will uh, serve as a good motivation to continue working on this very complex and very hard uh, experimental feature. Sorry, you are muted. Yeah, then because they're pounding outside my window, but I forgot to unmute. Uh, mm -hmm. We're at time. So uh, Alexei, as always, thank you so very much. And um, as I say in almost every single one of these sessions, but I still mean it, uh, community matters. Community matters immensely. Uh, we want to hear what you're building. We want to hear about your stories. We want to hear uh, about adopters that you know of. Um, for those of you in Boston, I'll reach out. Let's get a meetup set up. For those of you in other places, please feel free to reach out. And please share all of the amazing things that are in 23.4 with those who you know who could benefit from who could benefit from it. Sorry, my brain stopped there for a second. So cheers. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And we'll all talk soon. Thank you.